Human Rights Watch censors Saudi Arabia for committing an apparent war crime in Yemen. Erdogan is stepping up his rhetoric against the Kurds as Ankara wins NATO support for its offensive against the PKK and Daesh. And Iraq's premier meets with the commander of the U.S. Central Command to discuss the ongoing operations in Ambad province. Hello and welcome to the program. You're watching Al Tijah English News. We begin with Yemen tonight, where according to Human Rights Watch, Saudi Arabia has committed an apparent war crime. The Saudi military campaign against Yemen has been going on now for over four months, leaving behind a trail of death and destruction. More than six million Yemenis are on the brink of starvation. 80% of the Yemeni population, or 13 million people, are in dire need of urgent humanitarian assistance. According to Oxfam, months of war and a blockade on imports are pushing an additional 25,000 people into hunger every day. As the warring parties continue to ignore calls for a ceasefire, the average family in Yemen is left wondering when their next meal will be. The aid agency adds that one in two Yemeni, nearly 13 million people, are now struggling to find enough to eat. The blockade has exacerbated the humanitarian crisis in the country, which imports up to 90% of its food and the majority of its fuel. For its part, Human Rights Watch has censored Saudi Arabia for apparently committing a war crime against the Yemeni nation during its ongoing airstrikes against the impoverished country. With no evident military target, this attack appears to be a war crime. The failure of Saudi Arabia to investigate apparently unlawful airstrikes in Yemen demonstrates the need for the United Nations Human Rights Council to create a commission of inquiry. The New York-based rights group has confirmed that the strikes on July 24, targeting residential compounds in the Yemeni Red Sea port of Mocha, killed at least 65 civilians, including 10 children. Meanwhile, Saudi fighter jets are hovering over the Yemeni capital. Coalition airstrikes were also reported in Aden, as well as in Harad and Jumruk. The Saudi military campaign has also given rise to terrorist groups in Yemen. In the southern port city of Aden, Daesh militants are claiming to have opened a new training base. According to the militant group, they moved into the city as Saudi-backed militias forced the Houthi Ansarullah movement and its allies to withdraw from Aden. For more on this now, let's turn to Catherine Shagdam. She's a consultant with a Canada-based international defense and security consulting firm Anderson. Catherine, in your view, what are the possible implications uh, for the Saudis of this uh, Human Rights Watch condemnation? Um, I don't think it's going to need too much. I mean, you know, ideally we would like to see them go to the ICC and, and face, you know, all those allegations and answer to their crimes. Uh, but, you know, I think that given the political narrative right now, um, I don't think it's, gonna, it's going to happen anyway. Uh, but I think it's a, it's a step in the right direction in the sense that, you know, more and more the international community cannot ignore what is being done in Yemen by the Saudi. Uh, and I think that as far as the feel of blood has been reached, um, you know, the, the U.S. And, and the Western allies, you know, are realizing now that the Saudi are becoming, you know, political liabilities. Uh, and, you know, they're spilling blood more than they are worth, actually. Um, so I think that slowly it's going to change. But it's, it's, it's more about the people waking up to the reality of a life under Saudi Arabia. I think that, you know, why this, this, um, this report is so important. Because people need to understand that, you know, this empire that the Saudi are trying to build and have, you know, um, you know, arguably built over the decades, um, you know, needs to crumble because you cannot, you know, abide and condone those kind of actions, you know, going on in Yemen. It's impossible. Catherine, with the uh, Saudi bombardment there, as we heard, we're also seeing the expansion of the Daesh terror group. What is the link between the two? 
Well, I, I have my own personal, you know, theory, and, and I do think that I mean, if you look at where you know the Saudi have concentrated their efforts, um, you know, um, it, it's in the south of Yemen in Aden, where we know already um, that you know we we have had a radical elements present in those areas in Yemen, um, and if you know, indeed. The Saudi, where, as they said, were trying to outroot the Houthi and trying to, um, you know, um, in, defeat them essentially militarily. That you would think they would attack them where they are the strongest, which is in North Yemen. That's not the case. They're actually fighting in Aden, which is, you know, a very important seaport in the south of the country. And that means to me that what they're trying to do is, under cover of democracy building or liberalization or whatever it is that they're saying, they actually, you know, actively weaponizing Yemen, weaponizing those radical elements which are already present. And we know that, you know, Al-Qaeda has been in Abiyan and have been trying to break into Aden for years and years and years, and they have sleeping cells already there. So under the cover of this war, with this media blackout and with this humanitarian blockade, with no one coming in and out, it's very easy for the Saudi to send weapons to, you know, to ISIS radicals, to weaponize a lot of people, to train those radicals, uh, you know, without anyone knowing anything about it. And it's very easy for them to do. And the reason why they're doing this is because they realize that if they cannot defeat the Houthi and the Yemeni, you know, in the north, and that the south of Yemen is more prone to, you know, um, you know, to, to, to being radicalized, just because, you know, for decades, the Wahhabi and the Salafi have been very active in south Yemen, um, then they are, you know, they have decided to, to divide Yemen and to force them into some kind of a civil war, the like we have seen in Syria and in Iraq, you know, to, you know, to ensure that they would not build a strong democracy south of their border. It's actually very simple. Um, you know, what is actually scary now is that no one is picking up on it. Catherine Chuck Dam, as always, thank you very much for your time. Well, Ankara is, NATO rather, has offered Ankara political support in its military campaign against the Kurdistan Workers' Party, as well as the Daesh terror group in both Iraq and Syria. The move appears to have spurred on the Turkish president, who dismissed the idea of resuming peace talks with the Kurdish rebels. For days, the Turkish military has been carrying out attacks in Syria and Iraq. The target, the Kurdistan Workers' Party or the PKK and Daesh militants. As a NATO member, perhaps it's little surprise that Ankara received the backing of the Western-led military alliance. But the endorsement is strictly political. All allies expressed uh, their uh, strong support for uh, the uh, uh, for Turkey and we stand all together united in solidarity with Turkey and uh, all allies also condemned uh, terrorism in all its uh, forms. Okay. Turkey didn't ask for any additional military uh, NATO presence uh, in Turkey. Uh, what we uh, all know is that Turkey is a staunch ally. Uh, Turkey, have, uh, Turkey has uh, a very capable uh, armed forces. Uh, that vote of confidence was more than enough for the Turkish president to bury any hope of resuming peace talks with the PKK, which fought a 30-year insurgency in Turkey until a 2013 ceasefire. It is not possible for us to continue the peace process with those who threaten our national unity and brotherhood. There should have been national unity and brotherhood. Brotherhood comes above the peace process and it is a very comprehensive subject. Erdogan went as far as to accuse Turkey's pro-Kurdish parties, which made significant gains in June's general elections, of collaborating with the PKK and its Syrian offshoot, the YPG. What is our unforgivable crime? Our only crime is winning 13% of the votes and reflecting the people's wish at the ballot box. I am saying in brackets there is no other wrongdoing they can blame us for. While Erdogan may have got the heads up from the West over this latest air campaign, it looks like Baghdad isn't very pleased. The Iraqi cabinet said the Turkish bombardment of PKK positions in the north is a violation of the country's sovereignty, calling on Ankara to avoid escalating the situation.
Okay, let's get some analysis now. And for that, we can turn to Joaquim Flores. He's the director at the Center for Syncretic Studies in Belgrade. Joaquim, uh, with the support from NATO, which we've seen today, what is the next phase of this uh, Turkish operation likely to be? The, the next phase is, is going to be based upon our, our assessment of the events going back, of course, to the March 30th election. Uh, our sources on the ground gave us credible information in the middle of March when it appeared uh, that the Kurdish party in Turkey was going to make significant gains uh, in the March elections. Uh, that Erdogan was going to be committed towards uh, uh, in a strike against uh, Kurds wherever he could and however he could. Um, so I think that uh, moving forward, um, we are in a very serious predicament of a campaign for destabilization. This is a, a very uh, convenient way for Erdogan to settle defeats that he uh, suffered at the ballot box by resorting to sheer violence. And I think that this undermines the credibility of his regime. Um, I think that NATO's blessing is a very, very uh, honest uh, announcement on the part of NATO. And I think that moving forward, we can expect things to escalate and for them to continue to use uh, whatever Kurdish acts they may decide to use as a pretext uh, to further their military involvement actually in Syria and also in Iraq towards a general destabilization campaign indeed. Okay, uh, now I'm being told we can also bring in Mehdi El Afifi. He's a political analyst and media advisor joining us from Istanbul. Mehdi, I'm not sure if you could hear what Joaquin was saying there, but uh, would you say that we can expect this military campaign by Ankara to continue in the near future? Uh, yes, uh, that this campaign is not targeted to a specific group. It is uh, targeted uh, towards Daesh, uh, as we know. That this campaign was blessed by uh, the United States of America and also was blessed by NATO. Uh, there is uh, a, a, a desire to clear an area between Syria and Iraq uh, out of Daesh, and this is what Turkey is doing right now. Turkey is defending its own border, and uh, this is what we have seen. Joaquim, I see you nodding your head. Of course, we do know that the Turks are also bombing uh, the Kurds and the PKK in northern Iraq, not Daesh. Right, right. I, I, I agree with my esteemed colleague that the campaign will continue. However, what our friend has said is actually at odds with the U.S.'s endorsement. The U.S.'s endorsement specifically uh, was uh, at endorsing uh, Ankara's campaign against the PKK. So that is a specifically named group, and they're not Daesh. In fact, they have been uh, engage in a conflict against Daesh, and I and so I'm a little confused by the statement. I know that the, the what our my colleague has said reflects the news cycle from 48 hours ago of what they were going to do. But after it was widely reported and widely confirmed by media and journalists around the world that in fact Kurdish targets had been hit. Uh, subsequent to this, the U.S. did endorse that. So I'm I'm a little bit I, I would I'm asking for clarification on his point. Okay, Magdi, some clarification there. And also, what would you say to critics who are saying that this military campaign is not directed at Daesh? Rather, Turkey's agenda here is to check the territorial gains made by the Kurds in recent months. Okay, if we're going to look at what has happened in the past 48 hours, and part of it is a reflection of defending Turkey to its own border uh, by, uh, by targeting certain elements of uh, the Kurds, that have been fighting the Turks for a long time. I'm not here to defend uh, the Kurds or the Turkish, but uh, on the ground, it, it's an ongoing battle between Turkey and uh, the Kurds uh, of what's gained. Part of uh, the Turkey campaign is also what's important is defending uh, its own border against Daesh. So there will be some targets hit, there will be some conflict, and this is the reality of the conflict at hand right now. Joaquim, uh, have the Turks taken on on more than they can handle here? Have they bitten off more than they can chew fighting both Daesh, apparently, and the Kurds? I, I um, have read some reports, of course, that there are some Daesh targets. Um, I'm unclear as to the credibility of those reports uh, entirely. Uh, my questions, of course, revolve around why Daesh uh, fighters were given access to the region through Turkey, um, why they received medical treatment in Turkey, and so forth. So I, I, these are all big question marks hanging over my head. Um, what I would point to, however, is, is the fact that uh, Turkey seems to not uh, seem to be cognizant of the fact that both Syria and Iraq are sovereign states. 
uh, who have uh, their own territory and who cannot simply be bombed by a neighboring country without this being considered either a war crime or a crime against humanity. And I'm curious as to is what my colleague might think, uh, what uh, legal uh, historical pretext uh, that he might cite in relation to this clear abrogation of sovereignty, uh, of course, in the context of, of both the governments of Syria and <laughs> Iraq making statements uh, condemning these attacks. Okay, Mehdi, uh, your response to that there with regards to sovereignty, of course, both Syria and Iraq are sovereign states. Uh, the, the, the voice is very low. I can barely hear anything. Okay, let me, let me go ahead and repeat that. Uh, what Joaquin was pointing to there was the fact that both Syria and Iraq are sovereign states. I can't hear anything. Okay, Joaquim, I'm going to go back to you for the last point here. Uh, you know, with, uh, as you pointed out there, one of the big questions is uh, why has Daesh up to this point been given safe passage through Turkey and now uh, we've seen this U-turn? What would you say is behind that, at least in the public eye? Um, you know, we can look back to this tactic being used uh, in the last 12 years in the war in Iraq. Uh, we have, we have, I hope not escape from our memory, the, the famous uh, statements of Donald Rumsfeld and the old neocons uh, back, uh, gosh, 10, 12 years ago, talking about al-Qaeda uh, in Iraq and using this as a pretext to strike the Ba'athist government of Saddam Hussein. So we live, we're living clearly in an alternate universe where people who seem to try to understand the world can't attach facts to the statements of Western governments. And I think that I would only implore uh, listeners to, to look at, at these with a lot of skepticism. Okay, gentlemen, we are going to have to leave it there. I want to thank both of my guests in Istanbul, Mehdi el -Fifi, and in Belgrade, of course, Joaquin Flores. Thank you very much for talking to it, Tijo. Well, the Syrian army, backed by Kurdish forces, pushed Daesh militants out of Syria's northeastern city of Hasaka. According to the Britain-based Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, the army expelled Daesh fighters from Zuhur. That's, that was the last district controlled by the militant group in Hasaka's provincial capital. According to military sources, Syrian troops killed over 500 gunmen during those operations. Well, according to the UN aid chief, the conflict in Syria is the most acute, unrelenting and shameful blot on the world's humanitarian conscience. Stephen O'Brien said that some 220,000 people in that country have been killed, while 12.2 million are in need of humanitarian assistance. 12.2 million Syrians are in need of humanitarian assistance today. It is estimated that some 220,000 people have been killed in Syria since the start of the conflict. Over the past weeks, Mr. President, violence has continued to escalate across the country causing death and destruction, and complicating and severely impeding brave aid efforts. Indiscriminate and disproportionate attacks by all parties to the conflict, including through the use of barrel bombs and other explosive weapons in populated areas, remain by far the primary cause of civilian deaths and injuries. Not even residential neighbourhoods or places of community life public markets, schools, hospitals and places of religious worship are immune from attack. In the face of such violent, indiscriminate onslaughts, it is simply not difficult for each one of us to feel what it must be like for the Syrian people, community by community. Well, Iraq's Prime Minister Haider al-Abadi met with the commander of the U.S. Central Command, Lloyd Austin. The two reportedly discussed the current battle against the Daesh terror group in Iraq's western Ambar province. But many in Iraq are understandably suspicious of U.S. intentions. The country's national alliance, which includes Abadi's ruling state of law coalition, held a meeting during which lawmakers called for vigilance when it comes to Washington's role in the war against Daesh. Meanwhile, Iraq's defense ministry has announced that several areas in the western Ambar province have been liberated from the Daesh terror group. The Iraqi army, backed by the country's volunteer groups, has succeeded in liberating neighborhoods southwest of Ambar's provincial capital, Ramadi. Fifty Daesh militants were killed during Iraqi military airstrikes in western Ambar. The Iraqi army also killed several other militants in the northern parts of Salahedin province.
Muslim clerics and pro-Palestinian activists from across the world have gathered for an international conference in the Lebanese capital aimed at shedding light on the Palestinian cause. During the seminar, Hezbollah Secretary General Syed Hassan Nasrallah delivered a speech. He said that the issue of Palestine transcends politics and political interests. Said Nasrallah also added that Israel is the main beneficiary from the instability currently plaguing the Middle East. Palestine is the responsibility of the Palestinian people. Our responsibility is to support the Palestinian people. There are a lot of confrontations and conflicts. However, the nation is facing a Zionist scheme throughout the world. The Zionist scheme found its base through an entity named Israel. It is everyone's responsibility to confront the Israeli entity and its occupation of Palestine. The issue of Palestine is in need of a big campaign to remind people of the true nature of the Israeli enemy, because it seems there are some who quickly forget the Israeli terrorism. Well, Iran's Foreign Minister Mohammad Jawad Zarif hosted his EU counterpart Frederica Mogherini, who arrived for a one-day visit to Tehran on Tuesday. Speaking at a press conference, Zarif said that high-level talks between Iran and the EU will resume in the near future. The discussion will focus on energy and human rights. For her part, Mogherini hailed the nuclear deal reached earlier this month between Iranian officials and the P5 plus one group. Today we decided to start a new round of talks between Iran and the European Union, which we call at high-level negotiations. We have agreed to hold high-level talks between Iran and the EU over different issues, including energy cooperation, human rights, confronting terrorism and regional issues. I think that uh, this deal has shown very clearly that uh, diplomacy and multilateralism uh, do bring results uh, if uh, uh, all the parties are committed with strong political will and uh, with patience and with determination. And I think this was a good news for the entire region, for the world. And indeed, uh, now it is time to uh, show uh, that uh, not only reaching the deal, but uh, starting to work on the implementation of the deal is going to be historical. Uh, the new chapter we can open, this agreement can lead to open, is a different framework for the region. This is probably going to be one of the most difficult chapters to be opened, but uh, uh, I believe that this is going to be one of the most relevant ones. If we will manage to support a different understanding of the dynamics in the region, one that is based uh, on cooperation rather than confrontation or competition, this would lead to benefits for all in the region and beyond. You're with al Tijah English News, still to come on the program. Lebanon resumes garbage collection, but residents say the crisis is not over. The Libyan court has sentenced Muammar Gaddafi's oldest son as well as eight others to death for war crimes during the 2011 NATO-backed uprising which ended his father's rule. The former Gaddafi regime officials were sentenced to die by firing squad and included the former intelligence chief as well as the ex-prime minister. The verdict against Saif al-Islam, however, was passed in abstention in Tripoli because he's being held by the Zintan militia which is currently fighting 
The Tripoli-based government, now legal experts and rights advocates say that the proceedings were tainted and politicized from the start. No, it's not. It's not a judicial process, in my view. It's judicially sanctioned execution uh, at gunpoint. Uh, and so you have something which, as with all show trials, has all the trappings and outward shows of a trial with judges who are in judicial robes and appear to be judges and defence lawyers who appear to be there to do their role. But it's all window dressing. It's clear that uh, the militia wanted a certain outcome, that that outcome had to happen. Well, my position r remains... Um, that he should be delivered to The Hague. Um, whether he could actually have a fair trial in The Hague is, is now another question, because a lot of those co-defendants would be witnesses. If they're all executed, well, there goes any chance of him having a fair trial here. Well, Monday night, the Lebanese Environment Minister announced the immediate resumption of garbage collection from the country's streets. It's been over a week since garbage was collected across Lebanon. Now, by Tuesday morning, many of Beirut's garbage containers were empty, but some piles of rubbish could still be seen on the streets. Several protests were organized in Beirut's main commercial center, calling for a long-lasting and environmentally friendly solution for Lebanon's trash problem. <laughs> It's a problem that only Oscar the Grouch would want. Festering piles of trash in Beirut are triggering health warnings and protests by residents furious at a paralyzed government. The closure of a major landfill south of Beirut has been scheduled for some time, but the government has yet to come up with an alternate plan. And so the piles grow higher to the dismay of residents like Lamabu Karum, who just returned after a few days out of the city. I came today and was really shocked. There's no place without rubbish. It is not called rubbish anymore. It is mountains. We now have something new in Lebanon called trash mountains, aside from the smell. Lebanon's environment minister said the crisis is a result of political struggles in the country and procrastination by politicians. The prime minister is threatening to resign. Resident Amar says it's time for action. They should fix the situation because we will develop diseases. Don't we have enough diseases around? I wish officials would take a little more care of this subject. The trash crisis is damaging Beirut's reputation as a tourist destination, says Egyptian Mohammed Hassan. The country is beautiful, but what I am seeing from the overall situation and rubbish crisis is saddening because the country is touristic. When one comes once and sees this current scene, he won't be coming back. Governance is notoriously poor in the small Mediterranean country, but it has deteriorated since the eruption of the war in neighboring Syria. The presidency has been vacant for more than a year, and the parliament, elected in 2009, has extended its own term and postponed elections until 2017 on the grounds of instability. And now time for a recap of our top stories. Human Rights Watch censors Saudi Arabia for committing an apparent war crime in Yemen. Erdogan steps up his rhetoric against the Kurds as Ankara wins NATO support for its offensive against the PKK and Daesh. And Iraq's premier meets with the commander of the U.S. Central Command to discuss the ongoing operations in Ambad. That's it for me and the whole news team here. Thanks very much for watching. Good night.